Okay. I also would like to thank everybody for being able to present here in front of this great audience. And uh, what I will do here is I would like to put both of these papers in a broader context a little bit and related to the overall literature. So what I will, so what Andre's uh, presentation was all about belief dynamics. So how do you update deviating from the base rule essentially because you have some over updating or under updating. And I will go to that. That's essentially one big branch is to have really work on the beliefs itself and then see how the beliefs are evolving. There's some over optimism or irrational exuberance and particular extrapolative expectations. The other approach essentially is to have some market friction, financial frictions, and they come in different flavors. So one is an incumbent market markets a setting, whereas, for example, you have two states of the world, and you can typically, if you have complete markets, you can contingently trade on both states of the world. But because of some incumbent markets, you can, let's say, only issue a bond, and you can only move on this line. And uh, you can then have some leverage constraint on top of it. You can have a natural one, but this comes naturally out of risk aversion or some other behavior, or it can be ex explicitly imposed. So in uh, BGG, Bernanke Gottler Gilchrist, there's a debt limit which comes from the costly state verification a la Townsend. If you have um, and purely in Ayagari, for example, you have a debt limit which is exogenously given. It's independent of the price. That's how much you can borrow. Or it can be a collateral constraint. Uh, and then the constraint is actually how much you can issue depends on tomorrow's price. Like in Kiyotaki Moore, it depends on tomorrow's price, how much you can borrow. Similarly, in John G's work, it is also depends on Oh, sorry, in Giyotaki Mu, it's tomorrow's price. It can also depend on to the volatility of tomorrow's price and the worst outcome. So in John Genacopoulos work, actually in the binomial tree setting, it's the worst outcome, the credit surface, it's always the worst outcome, the lowest price tomorrow you can borrow. More generally, it can depend on the value at risk. If you, have, if you go beyond a binomial economy, it can also be more general on the credit surface, not just always the worst outcome. But most of his work focuses on a binomial setting. There are some papers which simplify the whole analysis and are just um, a focus on, on the current price, which is a shortcut but makes analysis much more simple. And then you have uh, search frictions. Uh, Duffy Galliano Peterson has started this literature, and that's it's another way to, to ha handle some financial frictions. So I will talk a little bit about belief distortions, and I will go over these various uh, constraints. But the way I would like to do it is I would like to emphasize in the different phases, the run-up phase, the crash phase, and the recovery phase, and focus on various different economic phenomena, like fire, selects, fire sales, spillovers, and so forth and uh, then talk later then about the volatility dynamics, which plays an important role in John's work as well, and, and talk about welfare and regulation at the end. And everything in 15 minutes. Um, so let's first go to uh, Andre's uh, work. Essentially, he focuses very much on representativeness uh, heuristic or this diagnostic beliefs. Essentially, you have some positive news and then you overshoot because of that and you, because you misrepresent the, the error um, and the way you update. And then that leads to some overestimation of uh, productivity after a good shock. You have some bubbles, you can overinvestment, and it's all driven by beliefs. And it goes beyond the traditional Miller 77 uh, framework where they're just over optimistic. Here, it is actually. You can do it in one person's uh, settings as a relative agent, and it's really about the dynamics, how you update over time. And Andre shows, of course, that uh, all the services are consistent with each other, and important, they're also consistent with uh, mutual fund flows. But everything you can think of of a single agent here who is doing the updating. Of course, he has some part of it where there is some settings that individuals behave very different from the aggregate, but that's an interesting uh, aspect to, to consider as well. Another uh, behavioral bias or belief bias is this local thinking where you neglect uh, the tail risk to some extent, so the worst outcome is actually neglected, you overlook it. Uh, you can link that and to a value at risk. If you have a value at risk constraint, for example, you don't, even, you don't take into account how the tail looks. You just look at the quantile, but you don't say it could be very bad inside the tail, but you don't uh, consider that. So that's uh, it's an alternative way of uh, capturing this neglect of the tail risk. So, but as I mentioned, in Andre's work, it can be all a representative agent analysis. In John Chi's work, he focuses very much on heterogeneous beliefs. So even though it's it's one way to model things this way, the other is neutral and they have heterogeneous beliefs, the optimists and pessimists. 
And once you put this limited commitment in it, you can get uh, this leverage cycle. The important insight essentially is that the marginal buyer moves around. And that's as you just illustrated, if there's a negative shock, the marginal buyer is actually a much less optimistic guy. And that's why the asset prices move around a lot. Okay? And this has implications, I would say, immediately to Andre's work in a sense that you know you, you might elicit from service some consensus beliefs, but what you really need for the asset prices is actually the margi marginal bias beliefs. And if we design in the future service, we might want to consider service which focus on uh, the marginal bias beliefs. Then the next framework essentially is you have some switching heterogeneous beliefs, and uh, that's essentially what leads to, shank, uh, leads to speculation. That's because of the resale options, you have some bubbles and other things, a la Harrison and Krebs and Shankman Shaw, and I'm sure that Josier will talk more about that, so I will not focus much on this framework. So there's homogeneous beliefs, but distorted heterogeneous beliefs, and then there's switching heterogeneous beliefs. Now, the second uh, on the run up, so run up can be driven from the beliefs and heterogeneity and switching in the beliefs because you create bubbles by doing so. It can also be generated by, uh, the and it always leads to a concentration of risk. So, what I have here is essentially a population with households who are not so good in managing the assets and experts which are better in managing the assets, and they are uniformly distributed, but the risk is concentrated among these experts. Okay, that's, you don't need this for the belief extrapolation, but typically with financial frictions, that's what's going on. So the experts hold most of the aggregate risk in good times. There's low volatility, but the risk is building up in the background. And then you have these two frameworks, so they can credit cycles versus leverage cycles. Okay, and that's essentially, when there's a leverage segment, there's also a credit cycle, but the leverage segment is more pronounced. Okay, what are the differences between the two? One is that after a string of good fundamental shocks, in a credit cycle world, actually, the people can save their way out of the constraint. Okay, because you have you highly levered initially, you have a string of good shocks, you become wealthier and wealthier if you're one of these experts, and then you save your way out of the constraint, and the buffer is actually increasing. Okay, that's in all these models: PGG, Kyoto Akimura, my work with Yuli. If you have the leverage cycle, on the other hand, uh, most is the risk is concentrated, and after a string of good fundamental good news, uh, then actually things get even worse because people level up more and more, because more and more optimistic guys uh, are, are leveling up. What's key for getting that, I think what's important is besides the heterogeneous beliefs, what's really key is that you have two more than two groups. In these models, you typically have farmers and gatherers or households and experts. Uh, in, these mo in, uh, in John Chi's work, you have a continuum of types and the whole asset is loaded more and more to the most optimistic guys if you have a sequence of good news. That's one ingredient, that you have this continuum of good groups of investors, not just uh, two. And the second thing is uh, bubbles cannot burst. They can only deflate. So they're more like uh, uh, balloons rather than bubbles. Uh, so to see that, so if you have this binomial tree, I focus on the binomial tree structure here, if you have a evolution of the states like this, where it always goes up and down, then it is a, if there's a positive news going forward, the worst state is also going. So in this state, the worst state is this. If you go up here, the worst state is this. If you go up here, the worst state is this. So as you go up, the, the worst case is going down, and with it, the debt capacity is moving up. Okay. If you have, on the other hand, a bubble structure like this, either can the bubble is growing, is growing, is growing forth, but it can be bursting down here, it can be bursting down here. So the worst case stays the initial level, the debt capacity is not moving up. Okay. So it depends very much on how you model the underlying evolution of the states. Now, now moving from away from the run-up phase to the crash phase, it's the first phenomenon is like fire sales. First, there was a big controversy in the crisis some people dismissing that such a concept exists, but here is one definition uh, that the assets transfers to the best, second best user. That doesn't occur in BGG because the price, uh, there's no second best user in Kyoto Kimur. This occurs, but of course it goes also Schleif and Vishni did this earlier, emphasizing the importance of uh, that capacity of this expert group is very important. The big question is, is our fire cells good or bad? But typically, if there are no second best users and you can't fire sell, the price will drop even further. There's actually, it's good to have another group which can catch up, uh, can catch these uh, assets when you have to fire sell them. But of course, once you fire sell them, there's a misallocation because it moves to these guys with a second best use. 
And it is also the case that ex ante, knowing that I can actually fire sell to somebody in times of crisis and take the price as given, this leads to this fire sell externality and this leads to ex ante to excessive lift risk taking and excessive leverage. And that's what Guido pointed out in his research and others. Jeremy has had some research on that. Now let me focus on the second phenomenon I would like to stress is this uh, paradox of prudence, which essentially said the behavior of individual banks is can be, uh, is they are micro prudent, but this might be macro imprudent. Okay, so that's essentially the same concept what uh, Keynes' paradox of thrift is, which essentially says, you know, everybody is trying to save more, but because everybody is saving more, at the end the whole economy is saving less. And here it's every bank tries to be prudent, and then the whole system becomes more risky by doing so. So you have these two spirals, you have a liquidity spiral, we talked about this, but you might also have a disinflationary spiral because the banks, they issue also inside money, like in, in Nobu's work uh, yesterday, they issue some inside money, and as they shrink the balance sheet, as they delever the balance sheet, the total money creation by the banking sector is going down, and that actually leads to a decline in total money supply, and this leads to deflationary pressure. On top of it, as bankers typically diversify idiosyncratic risk, idiosyncratic risk is pushed back to the households and entrepreneurs. They want to shift their portfolio choice to what's um, uh, more money holding, so the money demand is going up. So just doing a Friedman Schwartz, replacing the missing inside money with the additional outside money, like the money view, is not doing the trick. What you really need, you have to expand the money supply even further in order to get the credit going again. Then there is, of course, uh, another phenomenon is the spillovers across assets. Uh, you can have it in a belief distortion, but you can actually bake it, you have to bake it in. Most of the channels go through the net worth channels, uh, but essentially the, the experts essentially lose the net worth and they shed off all the assets. And what's interesting is also if you have multiple equilibrium story, like what uh, Olivier was mentioning earlier, if there's a jump in another equilibrium, all assets jump at the same time. So there's a coordinated asset price jump across all the assets. About the speed of the recovery, as the net worth uh, stabilizes again, there will be a deterministic recovery. I think what's important is if you have a more stochastic environment, that the length of the recession is, is stochastic, and this actually causes additional precautionary savings, and that makes the initial shock even more pronounced, and also makes the recovery much, much slower <laughs> endogenously. So let me emphasize this, so most of the literature focuses very much on impulse response functions where you have an amplification going on the initial shock, a temporary shock is persistent and then it feeds back so it amplifies and becomes even bigger. Okay, So you have this in the cradle cycle literature uh, which Lossie and I we call loss spiral. So you have this counter cyclical leverage going on because of this loss spiral. If you on top of it have this leverage cycle, which we call margin spiral because the margins are shooting up or Gary Gordon called repo run, but it's essentially the same thing. You can get that if you have this carry bad news. So you have an exogenous time variation volatility as you move along, volatility is shooting up and that actually leads to higher uh, destabilizing margins, the margins shoot up, and then you get this procyclical uh, leverage phenomenon. In the evidence, the empirical evidence is depends very much whether in the secured market or which market you're talking about, where you have this procyclical or this countercyclical dom uh, uh, force dominating. Let me point to something what's important more recently is that there's endogenous risk, so the whole volatility itself. You don't feed an exogenous volatility process in the analysis, but you, you feed a constant volatility process in the analysis, but then the volatility itself is endogenously uh, time-bearing, so the, the risk premium is time-bearing. So going up beyond the uh, impulse response function, I don't have time to go into that, but essentially you have this precautionary savings motive coming in, it's time-bearing and gives a role for money and, and the store of safe store of safe value in form of safe asset. And you get naturally all these non-linearities out of that. So the, you get endogenous fat tails, you get skewness, all that comes from these non-linearities. And you get this volatility paradox, where essentially what's interesting is that whenever volatility, the exogenous, what you feed in is very, very low, endogenous volatility will be much higher than total volatility is roughly stable. Okay, that's this volatility paradox. If you measure volatility, it means measured mid below, but it might be building up in the background because endogenous volatility is high. 
Okay, I have there's something on, on regulation. Uh, I will skip over that. Uh, there's interesting stuff to be said. Um, let me just conclude. I think there's this three phases, three mechanisms. Uh, they are belief focused or friction focused. Um, this paradox of prudence, the volatility paradox. And I think what's important is in these models to bring the financial sector beyond the financial sector, have physical investments and inside money creation in it in order to have a full money and, and banking framework. Thanks. <laughs>